Good afternoon. My name is Eric Sturgis. I'm the education team editor at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. And we'd like to welcome you to this edition of AJC Live, looking at politics in the classroom. So today's discussion will feature four panelists who will be talking about this topic. Um, and we will be, it will be moderated by our AJC reporters, Ty Tagami and Vanessa McCray. So first, one bit of housekeeping rule. Um, there will be a discussion among the panelists and then there will be a brief period for audience questions and answers. If you'd like to ask a question, please press the, go to the um, button on the top right hand of your corner with the question mark with the circle around it. So um, let's introduce our panelists. First, we have, we will have today, um, Will Wade. Will Wade is a state representative from Dawsonville. He's a former school board member, and he is the author of the bill that passed in 2022, House Bill 1084, which has been known as the Divisive Concepts Law. Next, we have Sonia Halpern, state senator from Atlanta. Senator Halpern is vice chair of the Senate Democratic Caucus and was an opponent of House Bill 1084. Next, we have Cole Musio. Cole is president of the Future, the Frontline Policy Action, the political arm of the Frontline Policy Committee. Welcome, Cole. And next, we have Fred Jones, a lobbyist for the Southern Education Foundation, which has advocated for education equity since the Civil War. So thank you all for joining us today. And I will hand it off to Ty and Vanessa. Hey everyone, I'm Ty Tagami. I cover education for the AJC, and I just want to thank all of our guests for being here for uh, what I think is going to be a really interesting conversation. I'm going to open it up uh, with a question straight. It's for uh, Senator Halper, and it's um, I'm going to say the beginning of all this, maybe two years ago, we started hearing an acronym CRT. No one knew what it meant. We came to learn what it meant. Then we started hearing DEI, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we hear that a lot now. And I wanted to ask uh, Sonia Halpern what that means to you and why you think we need it in the schools. Uh, well, first, let me say good afternoon. So glad to be joining you all for what I think is going to be a very rich and important conversation this afternoon. So thank you for the invitation. CRT, CRT stands for critical race theory. And DEI, of course, stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. DEI work, honestly, has been going on for decades. I myself know quite a number of people who have been in that space in human resources and really making sure that business is more reflective of the communities in which they're serving and their, and their clients. Um, in the school context, what we have seen in recent years is um, some pushback against these efforts to be more inclusive, to um, allow all of our st students and children to feel that sense of belonging in the classroom and in their school. And um, CRT has come to represent very bad words. Um, and CRT really is something that has always been taught more at the graduate level and really has never transcended into our classrooms and certainly not our K-12 space. But it's become a really bad word. It's being leveraged and weaponized as a bad word to suggest that, um, that, that people who, the people who have typically been marginalized, this would be black and brown communities, um, who are looking also for some truth telling in the history of our country, um, are really doing, are really wanting that in an effort to make other people feel bad about their history. So it's become this real tension um, between folks who are saying, let's be honest and truthful about our history and tell it as it is and be uh, more broad in the way that we're discussing it in the Rooms, and others who are saying, no, let's maybe be more restrictive in how we're talking about it so that um, so that uh, I think that the thought is that some children are feeling uncomfortable by some of these truths. Uh, thank you so much, Senator Halpern. This is Vanessa McCray. I'm the higher education reporter here at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, and I echo Ty. We're so thankful to have all of you here. Uh, Will, what what can you, I'd like to ask you a similar question. What 
does diversity, equity, and inclusion and CRT, critical race theory, mean to you? And why should uh, we purge it? Well, first, thanks for having me. And it's great to join my uh, friend and colleague, Sonia, Senator Halpert. Good to see you again and to all those that are hosting this. So first, I, I want to I start off the conversation with, you know, for me, looking back at my years, not only as a school board member, almost 16 years serving in a rural community in North Georgia versus being a student that uh, grew up in a small town where most of us understood this topic of differences as basically socioeconomic. And, you know, obviously I don't live in a community that has a diverse racial background, but we do have diversity in many other forms and fashions. And I agree with what uh, Senator Halpern said as it relates to the definitions. But I also want us to talk about this discussion and let's think and think more than we're feeling. Um, students oftentimes in today's world come to the classroom very much like a blank slate. And part of the reason that I was willing to work on House Bill 1084 and to bring the conversation as it relates to, to divisive concepts was to ensure that we continue to teach, you know, with, you know, great emphasis on the good, the bad, and the ugly of our history and our state and our nation, but to do so in a manner that it did not pit children against each other. You know, I look at the, the, the ecosystem of education, whether you're talking about math, English, science, social studies, history, music, physical education, athletics, all of those things need to be the primary function of those educators in the classroom and administrators ensuring that that's where they're pouring their focus while also acknowledging what's going on in the world around us, but never doing so as to put a child that happens to be of a certain race or a certain socioeconomic background against another child in that same classroom to pit them against each other. So for me, I think it's that diversity, equity, and inclusion should not be the primary focus. It should be something that is considered in the totality of that community, in the totality of the makeup of that individual classroom, and I believe teachers are very well equipped to address how to explain differences in many different forms and fashions where they continue to keep the main subject, the focus of what's going on. And also, I look forward to having a conversation about age appropriate, appropriateness and ensuring that we're focusing on acknowledging people's feelings, but doing so by allowing them to think, understand, and then think critically and come up with their own ideas as it relates to their place and their path in the pursuit of happiness in our country and in our state. Oh, okay, my turn. So um, thank you. Well, so uh, we're gonna move to uh, Cole. This is a question for you. So uh, there are nine concepts, for those not familiar with the divisive concepts law, there are nine concepts that teachers are not allowed to, uh, I think promote would be a good word. Um, and perhaps the most controversial is the first. It says that they cannot say that America is fundamentally racist, emphasis on is. And um, Cole, your group lobbied for that bill. I'm wondering why you wanted that language in law. Uh, well, first of all, yeah, thank, thank you for having us and uh, I appreciate the conversation. I wanna uh, thank in particular, Senator Sonia Halpern um, for, for her remarks. And I, I wanna acknowledge that she is one of the absolute best senators in the Georgia State Senate for being able to have an open dialogue and conversation. So I appreciate this. CRT is not a, is, is not a bad word. It's a Marxist ideology that says every conflict that we have is rooted in race. And so to your point, what HB 1084 does, which was written by Senator uh, Representative Will Wade, who's here and a, and a good friend, signed into law by our governor. And then that you know, overall agenda was voted on last November in, in 2022, which saw a huge increase in the governor's support. People of Georgia support this. And by the way, when we polled this issue, only 25 percent of Georgians support CRT, which there's a lot of misnomers about. I think we have more education to do to pull that number even further down. But, you know, you talk about those nine phrases, and I think those are unifying phrases. The first one actually is that people are that um, one race is superior to another. Uh, we don't want to teach in any school in the state of Georgia that one race is superior to another. And that should not be divisive to anybody. Uh, the second point to your to your question is that the United States is fundamentally racist. The United States of America has some terrible racist history in its background. Absolutely. 
And that is not forbidden from being openly discussed or talked about or a key point that we need to make sure that we learn from. I mean, good grief, that, that, that is a dark period in history. And it is one that we continue to suffer from the sins of slavery and continue to look past at, at, throughout our history and go, look, this, this sin of slavery is something that has cost us and continues to cost us today. But it's the United States of America, a fundamentally racist nation, and with that CRT Marxist ideology, is that racism something that defines the entire country? I think that's that's a false concept. Most most Americans and most Georgians agree on that. There are racist elements in our history. There are racist people in our history. There's racist elements in our country now. There's racist people in our country now. We need to talk about that, but not from a place of condemnation of an entire country and an entire idea that is the United States of America, but from a place of how do we learn from our history and get better from it? And so you break down those nine concepts, that one being the second one race being one race being superior to another being the first one. You look at others, um, you know, judging people on the basis of their race, making people feel guilt or anguish based on the sins of an entire race. All those kinds of things. You break down those nine concepts. Those are unifying concepts when, that when people look at it from all different kinds of races, um, they look at that and go, yes, we, we can agree that one race isn't superior to another. Our kids should not be taught that. Uh, that they should be racially scapegoating another race. Those kinds of things are unifying concepts. And that's why HB 1084 was signed into law. And then when you look at the state of Georgia, which had, which had a chance to vote on this education package in November of 2022 with big different you know, versions of what people would do with Governor Kemp and uh, Stacey Abrams, they voted resoundingly in favor of what happened in the 2022 legislative session. I, I'm going to jump in here and ask Fred if you could kind of respond to some of what we've heard um, uh, Cole address. I think we've heard teachers express concern that uh, the divisive concepts uh, bill has kind of a limiting impact on how they teach. And so that's what we've heard. But I guess my question to you is, is America still fundamentally racist? And what might students miss out um, in learning because of laws like this divisive, con divisive concepts law? Well, thank you, Vanessa and, and Ty and the whole HAC team. Uh, Representative Wade, I'm glad to be here with you as long, along with my dear friend, Senator Halpern, um, and my colleague, Cole, who I, who I just had the opportunity to meet. Well, I just, I'm honored to be on the, the panel with you all. Uh, I just wanted to respond to a couple of different things. Um, the way the Defensive Concepts Law is written, I think there's a concern about what the vagueness of what is allowed to be taught in the classroom and what isn't. And so um, actually it says that there are the, the discussions of uh, slavery, the discussion of racial oppression are, are allowed under this law, which it is, um, but it's a matter of in what magnitude and what capacity. And teachers have explicitly expressed they don't know what they can teach and what they cannot teach. I think there's the, the other issue is what is enforceable. So I think the issue that I have um, and we have with the law is a teacher who could be teaching a subject about slavery may be reprimanded in one part of the state, but in the exact, if you teach the exact same lesson in a different part of the state due to the nature of the district's policies can, can be completely interpreted in a way that may lead to someone being dismissed or fired or punished in some way. So I think for for us, there's there's two big big issues. One, we don't know what is allowed and what isn't. Um, and then two, what is going to be enforced and what won't be enforced. It creates a chilling effect on teachers and what they decide to put in the curriculum or not. We've heard reports of people just being, one, afraid to bring up any topic, whether it's related to Jim Crow, uh, the Middle Passage, the Reconstruction era, uh, the Civil Rights era. Um, and even current events today. So I think what's happening is, is when you actually put this into practice, there is confusion and that confusion is creating um, content that glosses over some of these big profound issues that we do need to talk about in the classroom as uh, my colleagues have, have mentioned, but it's a matter of how. Representative Wade, what, what do you respond to that, this idea of ambiguity and confusion um, creating this kind of culture where teachers maybe don't know what they can and cannot say or where it's permissible in one part of the state and not the other? Does the, does the law address that or 
What are what's your response to that? Sure, I'm happy to discuss that. So I, I'd like to say first the the law itself is actually fairly targeted to specific divisive concepts so that it would bring clarity to teachers. The reason that we did not go in and change Georgia's teaching standards is because we believe that the standards align with the, the law as it's written so that teachers can continue to discuss the atrocities of the past. They can use those as examples and teaching lessons specific as to how far we've overcome those situations. Um, I understand I'm, I'm a husband of a career educator. I'm a son of two educators. And I believe that many times when there are laws passed and I remember as a school board member, I wanted to make sure that I had an understanding of what the intent of the legislature was in order for us as a school board to continue to uh, follow the law, but also allow our teachers to have, uh, you know, some academic um, ability to, to teach in their class. This does not change the Georgia standards. So if you're continuing to talk about uh, slavery or if you want to talk about the civil rights movement, you can discuss those atrocities. It's just don't do it in a manner in which it causes conflict as it relates to an individual student or their race in the classroom or to, to assume that today that America is racist because we had racist events in the past. Um, and I appreciate uh, the gentleman that brought this forward. I mean, there, there's been some folks that have reached out and asked questions and clarity. And when, when you break down those um, specific uh, nine divisive concept definitions, if a teacher's teaching their classroom, and they're teaching a subject where this topic comes up, it's going to be a pretty uh, obvious hurdle for someone to prove that they have done so. Uh, and they don't really need to be fearful. They need to continue to teach as long as they're not doing so to try to pit a, a child, one child against another based on the color of their skin or to somehow claim that in today's society, when we've had uh, defense, the, 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 the top leaders in our country come from all races and backgrounds, even if you look at today's presidential uh, primary season, especially on the Republican, we have folks, both male and female, we have folks from all walks of life. We've got folks that are white, African-American, Indian American. I mean, we've got folks that have all kinds of racial backgrounds and that's what makes us the melting pot. It's what makes us great uh, in this country. And so, yes, we need to learn from the past. Um, we need to continue to uh, support teachers. The, the other thing that the bill did, and I think this is uh, lost on a lot of people, and I understand, I want folks to know that we have local control in Georgia. Governor Kemp supports that. The legislature supports that. That's why we allow for a process so that there is a concerned parent or a concerned peer educator or a concerned student in which they feel as though or they think based on actual evidence in the classroom that this law has been infringed upon, that there's a process for that to be heard so that parents and community members and teachers and administrators can sit down and address the incidents as they occur and go through that thoughtful and diligent process to honestly, I think, create an opportunity for conversation to build upon and build unity and understanding so that it won't create um, incidents that we um, unfortunately had uh, during some of the dark days in our history. The point is, is to make sure that we continue to have conversations like this, to talk about it uh, candidly and openly, but also make sure that we realize you know, I learned a long time ago when I became a parent, um, I've got a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old. Our children are very capable of instantaneously loving each other, no matter what. And they have a capacity for empathy and understanding that I think many times folks that are not in the classroom day in and day out or aware of what's going on, I think we're actually holding them back to their capacity and their ability to actually build unity more often than not. The media loves to spin, no offense to the AJC, but the, the broader, especially national media, likes to spin division and they want to showcase the negative incidents, but they never tell the good stories that are going on in every nook and cranny in big schools and small schools in this state. So to me, it's an opportunity to showcase the goodness that's going on in our classrooms, the, the, the building of understanding and learning in our classrooms, and not continuing down, um, allowing the, the ills of the past to continue to keep us in the shadows. We need to bring sunlight. And that's what I believe that this opportunity can do. And uh, I think most teachers and administrators and principals that have worked with organizations at the state have heard this message. We need to continue to educate them so that they don't need to be fearful when they're teaching. And um, I think if you keep it on those basic, those, those divisive concepts, and listen, there are college professors that want to say 
that America is racist. I just don't believe there's any evidence to support that claim. And I think a college setting is probably the best place to have that argument. And um, I don't think that's something that we need to allow in our K-12 setting. We need to allow kids to showcase that we are every single year that passes, there are less racist events that occur in our nation and that racism will go to the ash heap of history at some point. That's my goal and that's my hope. Thanks, Representative Wade. I think that uh, I think that Ty has a question for Sonia. I do. Um, so sorry about that. Um, so I wanted to build on what Fred and, and Will said. Um, I've heard from teachers the same thing that Fred was saying about confusion, vagueness. Um, and Will was talking about um, kids, their ability to empathize. And so we have a concrete case in Cobb County where a teacher is, you know, potentially going to be fired for bringing what she thought was um, a lesson of inclusion into the classroom with a book uh, involving gender identity. Um, and, uh, and she's being told that that was a, a controversial topic to introduce. And so, Sonia, I'm wondering, is gender identity a now a like a divisive concept that um, teachers shouldn't be teaching in the classroom? Well, I would not personally argue that this is not something that they should be teaching. Um, what I would say is that there is consternation around whether they should be introducing these concepts. In this particular case, our teacher read a book. This is a Cobb County teacher. She read a book and it was about inclusion and belonging, kind of a, a transgender LGBTQ community. And ultimately, because of bills like the one we were just discussing, um, there was a complaint lodged against her. If I'm not mistaken, though, the students actually, when the students were asked what book they wanted read, this is the book that they chose. She read that book, uh, a parent lodged a complaint, and it did go through that complaint process. And by the way, there's always been a complaint process available to parents who've had any concerns ever in the schools. What is different now is that laws like this actually... Um, actually bring much more attention to and a much more bigger focus to is this punishable by um, being terminated uh, it, it it actually just makes any of these situations that happen that are so far and few between it really puts that magnifying glass on them in any case this particular teacher was given the choice um, by the school board to either resign or be terminated um, in an appeals process it went to a tribunal who decided that they did not agree with the assessment that she should be terminated or fired the school board, I think, ironically, later on today is set to take this back up and they will make the final decision on whether or not they will accept the tribunal's recommendation. So the, the reality is that on the ground, boots on the ground for teachers, they aren't sure of what's in the lines and what's outside of the lines. Um, I would like to also say this particular bill also included a piece in it that in the Senate, I was success. There were two. There were two of these divisive concepts bills. In the Senate, I was successfully able to um, do an amendment on the floor that got passed unanimously. That would have taken away the ability for a DA to come in and actually also take action against teachers. I believe that in this final bill, that's still in there. But that threat of something going from like an issue just within the school to something that's more civil to potentially criminal does have a chilling effect on teachers who all want to do the right thing by their students. I don't know of a teacher yet who comes into the classroom with a, a goal to harm or hurt their students. And for students, I want to I wanna actually echo what Representative Wade said. I too am a mom well, he's not a mom. I'm a mom. I have three kids. Uh, one is elementary school age. I have another who's high school age and I have a college age um, son. And so ultimately, if we trust our teachers, 
and know that they have been well trained so that they know how to teach hard topics. And if we trust our students who we want to develop empathy, we talk a lot since certainly since COVID about the social emotional piece of what our children are also getting out of their education, in school education. Um, and so how, how do we not trust the teacher and the student and the parents all together, because we, I think, all do believe in that parent-school relationship, um, to know that, that we can sort these things out without having to build into state law uh, what can and cannot be taught, what can and cannot be shared. We are seeing more and more pushes against certainly transgender students um, in laws beyond just this one that we've been talking about so far. Thanks for that. I wanna briefly and quickly switch gears because we just have a few minutes before we're gonna bring in some uh, some live reader questions. But while we were preparing for this, uh, Ty and I were thinking about uh, the questions we wanted to ask you. And we also got some advanced questions that mirrored some of the same things we were wondering. And so Cole, to you, if you could just briefly kind of give us a, a forecast about what's ahead. Um, specifically, I wanna to turn to higher ed. We've seen the University of Georgia, um, or excuse me, the University System of Georgia recently respond to Lieutenant Governor's uh, request for an accounting of how much public colleges here in Georgia are spending on diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. And um, Stephen asked, and I also am interested in knowing how likely is it that uh, organizations such as yours would push and the legislature would pass for a bill that would eliminate DEI spending at public colleges? Will, you wanna take that question? I think we lost Cole. Uh, I'll be happy to take it the best of my knowledge. I'm not on the Senate, so, but I will say, you know, in Georgia, our constitution, um, has a good bifurcation between that of K-12 and higher ed. So I know that the chancellor and the board of regents are working on this issue. I think um, my opinion, based on what I've read, what I've heard, what I've studied, and I think Cole's back on, so I'll just finish with this and you can let him respond as well, is it's a matter of keeping the focus on the primary objective of our colleges and universities in the state to continue to build on a strong workforce and um, the pipeline for careers and jobs in every industry across the state and acknowledging that maybe there has been too much emphasis um, in that area that has uh, honestly caused some educators to, to leave the, the, the public sector in the K, uh, the higher ed area, as well as uh, turned off many students from believing that that is, that they went there to learn to get an engineering degree, or they went there to get a mathematics degree or a science degree. And then there's more time spent on something that they don't necessarily believe is a problem or an issue. So that's that's what I've been hearing. That's what I see. Um, but I think that the the legislature will will assist after the chancellor and the board of regents have taken on this on. And um, Cole, I'm sure if you want to fill in any opinion you've got since they went to you first. Yeah, I just cool. Is that a is looking at diversity spending at public colleges a priority or on the radar screen of you or other organizations? Uh, yeah, and I, look, I, I apologize. I've had some tech issues, so hopefully y'all can hear me now. I, I said if anybody had tech issues, it'd probably be me. Um, <laughs> no, we can but, hear you. <laughs> well, good. Look, our, our biggest focus is on what's happened in the K-12 classroom. I think that, I think it's we're, we're in a really, really dangerous spot that we just talked about the book that was read in Cobb County that was read to fifth graders. Um, and so that that's, and only 14% of parents uh, support having those kind of sexual discussions prior to the age of sixth grade uh, in the state of Georgia. So that's, that's a serious topic. Uh, DEI is one of those things. I mean, I think CRT is rooted in Marxism. It's a bad ideology. DEI comes from good intentions, but it's got bad consequences. And so we're going to look at how that's manifesting itself across the state of Georgia, where we're spending money, and is it turning into something that's uh, about divert, about exclusion more than actually inclusion? Um, you know, DEI in itself, itself sounds nice, but when it becomes about exclusion and emphasizing differences as opposed to promoting inclusion, uh, which I think is kind of where we are with DEI. It's about emphasizing differences and promoting division rather than inclusion. And I think we need to look at it, you know, how we have our taxpayer dollar spending. I think uh, Burt Jones is doing a good job, not saying, look, we oppose all DEI, you know, we oppose diversity or anything like that. Let's get into counting. Where, where are we spending money on this and how, how's that going? 
Um, and I think that's an important thing that we as a state take a look at. But the biggest the biggest crisis we have right now is 79 percent of parents across the state of Georgia are concerned about indoctrination in the K-12 classroom. And so we've got to address that. Cool. Thanks a lot. So um, we've had our shot. I think the readers out there have a lot of questions to ask. So I'm going to turn it over to Eric and um, he can voice uh, their questions. Thanks, Ty. And um, before I go to the reader questions, I do want to make a correction um, in Fred's title. I think um, he is the Senior Director of Advocacy and Policy for the Southern Education Foundation. So apologies, Fred, on that front. Um, yeah, we've really had some good questions from the audience. And um, the first one is, um, and this here is from Michael. I do not understand the involvement of the state legislature in local state local school district matters, nor supplanting the role of the state board of education in setting curriculum. Please explain. So maybe I'll direct that question to um, Representative Wade. Well, I appreciate the question. Um, to the, it, was it Michael that was the questioner? Uh, mm -hmm. Michael, in Georgia, we have a par partnership between the state and the local communities. Uh, right now, the state of Georgia funds a great percentage. It is. In our constitution, it is our priority to fund education, and we represent over 50% of our budget. And I want to point this out. This is important. We at the state have fully funded QBE under the Brian Kipp administration and the Georgia legislature, and it's been bipartisan. I think, I believe Senator Sonia Halpern voted for that same budget in the Senate to do so. We have funding locally as well. So it is a partnership. Uh, in serving children across the state. So that's the reason the state legislature takes interest in concerns that Cole mentioned that parents will reach out to, to ensure that those taxpayer dollars, whether they're coming from the state or from the local community, are going toward the primary objective, which is to provide an education, um, whether it's on a K-5 setting or middle school or high school, that it's age appropriate, that it's building the, the blocks for economic, um, you know, success uh, for the community and for those children. So I think it's a partnership and that's the reason the state legislature has a role, just like we have a role at the local level. Uh, Senator Halpern, did you want to answer that as well? Respond to that? I mean, I, I, I think Representative Wade really covered it. I mean, ultimately, you know, we take seriously our part of the job, which is to make sure that funding is in place so that our public school, our, our students who are being educated in public schools, which is the vast majority of our students in the state of Georgia, are able to have the resources that they need and be able to ultimately, and, and we touched on this very briefly, but you know, we want to create students who are able to be successful in this world as grown-ups. I mean, in, in many ways we can we can talk about elementary, middle, high school, college, and differentiate that. But any school, any any child once from the time they enter kindergarten, ultimately we want to make sure that there are pathways for that child that at the end of um, that path that that there's something for them at the end of every pathway, um, whether that is going on to university, whether that's going on to technical college, whether that's entering into the workforce. But ultimately, we understand that it is our role to make sure that we have students who can be productive in the workplace and help make Georgia the state that it is. Okay. Um, we have this question from Ann. House Bill 1084 introduces fear into the classroom and works against the Georgia standard of excellence to achieve critical thinking. Can the teacher shortage be linked to this law? And I guess I'll just, um, this time we'll just direct those que this question to um, either Cole or Fred or have both of you answer that one. I, I can jump in and, and try to answer this, but I did want to respond to a comment earlier just about uh, DEI. I, I just I have a different interpretation of it. I think diversity, equity, and inclusion is about understanding our differences and creating unity. And I think the only way we're able to do that is we understand where people are coming from and create a vision for the future. And so um, it's important for us to define diversity, equity, inclusion as it relates to where we're spending our money, where the focus will be. Um, but that also includes people, not people of certain race or sex, sexual background or sex background. It's also about the status of veterans, it's about rural students, it's about um, students with special needs, it's about creating an inclusive system. Um, so I just wanted to, I just wanted to respond to that. But also, 
um, as it relates to the teacher shortage, I, I mean, we were having a teacher shortage prior to uh, the, the defensive concept law. Um, there's many things that were going into that. I think this doesn't help. I think th there has been teachers that have expressed fear um, because they don't know what they can and cannot teach and they don't know what they would be reprimanded for. And children are resilient. Um, they can have these discussions. And I would say 75% of our population today actually is against the banning of uh, books uh, that are out there now. They're open to uh, having critical um, conversations about sex and race in the classroom because they are resilient. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that we highlight the fact that like, at the end of the day, it's our students who are potentially could suffer for this because they're not able to receive a comprehensive education on these critical issues that we are actually having right now. And we should try to welcome and endorse and create, create a safe environment for these types of discussions to take place age appropriately in the classroom. Um, and I think what's happening now is teachers are feeling a certain way that they just may be reprimanded if they decide to go down that route, which is taking place not only here in Georgia, but in other places across the country. I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll build on that. I, you know, I'd love to say, you know, we've got two people from each side, you know, arguing, arguing different points, but I, I've heard a lot of commonality today. You know, I, when talk, talking about the nine principles in 1084, I've not heard pushback on any of the nine principles. I've heard, hey, there's some vagary, there's some concern there. So, you know, let's, let's address that. On DEI, the DEI definition that you just provided, um, those are good things to talk about. Let's, let's have a serious conversation about it. I, you know, I, I, we need to have a more inclusive society that's diverse and we welcome that. I'm concerned about abuse and how that concept that you've laid out has been distorted into something that wasn't intended to be. So, you know, I think, you, you know, you said, hey, let's have a conversation about it. Let's look at it. Let's have an accounting of it. I think that's a serious thing that we need to do as a state, um, you know, but to a teacher shortage, what I would say is you look at those nine things in HB 1084, you know, that we should be teaching children, that children are fundamentally racist, that you should blame children based on the actions of their entire race, uh, that you should racially scapegoat, all those kinds of things. If a teacher or a potential teacher is looking at those nine concepts and says, I want to be able to teach those things. And because I'm not going to be able to teach those things, therefore, I'm not going to be a teacher. That's someone that doesn't belong in our classroom. And so we, we are doing things to make sure that there's more teachers. Governor Kemp and, and this legislature have funded teachers. They've increased their pay. Uh, we're doing things to attract more teachers. I think teacher shortage is a problem. Um, but if a teacher is looking at that and going, hey, I, I want to bring my political ideology into the classroom and I want to be able to teach that kids are fundamentally racist, that's not a teacher that we want in our classroom. So, um, yeah, let's address the shortage, but let's not attribute the wrong thing to it. And let's not try to just welcome teachers that are going to make our classrooms more political. I think that's that's the big concern. Um, classrooms have become places of politics and it is not Republicans. It's not conservatives that have gone on the aggression here. It's a reaction to classrooms becoming a place where we're infusing our political ideology into our children. This was when we did our survey. It was a universally agreed upon principle. Sixty percent of liberals were concerned about indoctrination going on in classrooms. And so we've got to make sure that we address that, I think, with HB 1084, SB 226, HB 1178, a series of legislation has done their best to address not putting classrooms, uh, politics into classrooms, but taking it out. And so we're going to try to recruit and then bring in teachers that want to teach, want to educate, want to pe teach people like me how to you know, use a computer and be able to do a live stream, not just, uh, you know, not just impose their political ideology in the classroom. I guess it is my experience in talking with the teachers here, and I'm also a parent of uh, great children in, in Georgia. Teachers aren't coming in wanting to teach those nine concepts. I think where the challenge is, is certain topics may, parents may report that they feel as those, those concepts that are prohibited are taking place in the classroom when the teacher's not doing that. And so I think that is the, you know, the difference of opinion here is, is the fact that this is harming the teacher's ability to create content in a full, complete way versus them wanting to come in and, and indoctrinate or, you know, bring their personal beliefs in the classroom. And if I could just build on that just for a second, what I want to say is that 
these kinds of bills though take an inordinate amount of time we have 40 legislative days that is it in each session and these kinds of bills end up dominating the conversation when there are so many other issues that we really do need to address within our education that's both uh, you know that's pre-k that's zero through five that's k-12 that's university level that's technical college system and so these kinds of conversations and bills dominate so much of the conversation and the oxygen in the room that it feels like we are not addressing some of the much bigger issues that are bipartisan, by the way. We talked about school funding. You could see how much unity there was between what myself and Representative Wade was saying about that. We all recognize teacher shortages is a, is a problem. There's a statistic that I want to throw out here on the teacher shortage issue, beyond just teacher shortage, we have a shortage and a crisis in teachers of color. Most students, I think this is a stat, I don't know the Georgia one, but across the US, from K through 12 may only have, may only have one teacher of color in their whole experience. And the truth of the matter is there are, there are more people of color in this world uh, than not. And so all students benefit from having a diversity of teachers, a diversity of experiences in the classroom, a diversity of students in their classroom. And that may not be possible in every single community throughout the state. But just I, I'd like to remind us that um, d diversity ends up being good for everybody. And, and as we're raising young people who will have to go out into the bigger world that is a global world and a global economy and be successful, some of these early experiences and, and the ability to start to think critically. I think the word indoctrination is used. And of course, if you ask this in a, in a survey, it's going gonna, it's gonna to gin up you know, a, 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 a resistance amongst all parents. It, it does for me as well. But if you strip down the layers, right, and you say, if we're having conversation, this is different than we're making students feel a certain kind of a way about it. But there could be, and I'm going to go back to some of the race, racial stuff and slavery. There is an ability for us to allow students to be critical thinkers. This, these are the 21st century skills every business is looking for. How do we give students a place where they can have difficult conversations and disagree? They don't necessarily all have to come away saying we now all believe X, Y, Z, but at least they're trusted to be able to have conversations. Our teachers can be trusted to lead those discussions in the way that they've been professionally trained. And and everybody's the better for it. Well, we have two minutes left, but I did, did want to ask this one question that, um, that's been asked. Um, it says, Representative, Wait, this is from Dory. Representative Wade, you emphasize that teachers can instruct children about racism in history, the Civil War, slavery, the Civil Rights Movement. Can they also teach about how the racism of the past continues to impact the economic reality of Americans today? So I'll take it this way. So I had a, a, a teacher who uh, is in my district who was teaching the topic about um, the event of redlining and, uh, and the banking. I'm also a community banker. And I would say that there are now civil money penalties because we highlighted through legislative, both at state level and at the federal level, that people should not be excluded from access to capital based on their zip code or where they live. And so to me, I would say that because those things happened in the past, we now have policies that you can teach in the classroom to explain that. But now that is illegal. Redlining is illegal and they should be able to teach that. So I, I think there are obviously with a lot of policy, there's nuance. It's a great question. And I think that teachers can go through and teach factually exactly how we ended up with certain laws because of what happened in the past. But I will also to kind of cover what uh, Senator Halpern was saying, you know, we went through a deep dialogue when we were uh, working on this legislation. Most children, I have a child that was uh, honestly was very upset when she heard that a person was put at the back of the bus because of her skin color. She was torn up about it when she came home to tell me my daughter experienced her own empathy 
I was proud as a father that she, that, that was her interpretation of a negative thing in the past. There are other kids that may not be necessarily as outwardly empathetic. We don't need a teacher to tell a child, you have to feel a certain way about a certain event in the past. Children should be able to come through that. So that's, that is the, the reason that the bill is, uh, has that language. Teachers won't be punished if children experience a response. Uh, that's part of what we want to happen in, 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 in each individual child's life. So it's not necessarily to say that there are not remnants of racism throughout lots of things. I can tell you there's actually more remnants to this day that have to do with how you are um, viewed based on your value of your assets. If you come from a, an impoverished home or um, a community that doesn't necessarily have the same zip code. I experienced uh, something personally when I went to college up in the Northeast for a graduate program. I sound like a Georgian. Nobody else in that program was from Georgia. It was a very difficult experience. I was an adult and I was equipped to handle it. But the point is, is that's another form of uh, separation that we have to figure out a way to build unity. And to me, I, I think that in today's society, we need to spend time focusing on tackling the differences between socioeconomic situations and not necessarily keep everything about race. We are all people. God created every one of us as a color. My dad and mom taught me as teachers, look, you are a color too. You just happen to be lighter than some other people that God created in this world. So I hope that we can continue to build uni. I appreciate my friend, Senator Sonia Halpern. We're from the best class ever. It's great to see you. And Fred, appreciate your articulation yeah. of your thoughts and Cole as well and Eric for hosting today. It's been, a, it's been a joy and I think we have to continue to communicate and think so that we can build unity and I appreciate the opportunity. And unfortunately we are out of time today, but this has been a great session and there are a lot of great questions that were still in the queue. I may just direct some of the, these to you all offline. Um, again, thank you audience for joining us today and we thank you for your continued support to the Atlanta Journal Constitution. Please continue to check us out on AJC.com in our print edition and also subscribe to our weekly newsletter. So uh, with that, we'll say have a great afternoon. Thank you.